Welcome everyone, and thank you for being here this evening. My name is Sarah Freeman, and I'm the Director of Exhibitions at Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. <clears throat> Before we start, I would like to remind you all that admission is free for tonight's event. But if you'd like to make a donation at any time, you can do that on the BMAC website, brattleboromuseum.org. Tonight, we're going to hear from artist Allison Moritzugu, whose exhibit Moons and Internment Stones is on view at BMAC until Sunday, February 12th. Allison will speak about her work and the exhibit, and then she will be joined by Erin Shigaki, an artist and community activist who works with Densho, who partnered with us to produce this event. Uh, Densho is a Seattle-based public history nonprofit whose mission is to preserve and share the history of the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans to promote equity and justice today. Their extensive archives and educational resources can be accessed at www.densho.org. And at a couple of moments during the talk, I'll be sharing some links in the chat from Densho for those who may want more information. Um, Aaron and Allison will talk about the family history of incarceration and art's role. And then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A with all of you. So please feel free to put questions in the chat box, or if you're joining us via Facebook, simply add them to the comments section. So I'm gonna start off by asking Allison and Erin to both turn on their cameras and join me here while I introduce them. And then I'll hand it over to Allison and she'll take it away. All right. Hello. Still not almost seeing Allison. There she is. Hello. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Great. So Allison Moritsugu was born and raised in Hawaii and now lives in Beacon, New York. Her work has been exhibited in solo shows at the Honolulu Museum of Art, at First Hawaiian Center, Lux Art Institute, Little John Contemporary, John Michael Kohler Art Center, and the Knoxville Museum of Art. She received a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Painting and participated in residencies at the Cité Internationale des Arts, Yado, the McDowell Colony, and the Marie Walsh Sharp Space Program. She holds a BFA from Washington University and an MFA from the School of Visual Arts. Erin Shigaki is a Yonsei, fourth generation Japanese American who creates art that is community-based and focused on BIPOC experiences, such as those of members of her community incarcerated during World War II. She seeks to understand intergenerational trauma and to explore the emergence of beauty and intimacy despite unspeakably harsh circumstances. She believes that wielding art and activism to tell these stories can educate, redress, and incrementally heal. Erin has received grants and commissions from numerous institutions, including Den Show, the Wing Luke Museum, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, the Kip Takuda Memorial Washington Civil Liberties Grant, the Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, and the National Academy of Design's Abby Mural Prize. She holds a BA from Yale University. Thank you both so much for being here this evening. And Allison, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about some of my previous work and then move on to the work that's being shown in Brattleboro. I'm a visual artist whose works consist of paintings, some sculpture and wallpaper pieces. And my art examines our relationship with the land and the environment. I'm really inspired by other landscape painters throughout history, such as the Hudson River School of Painters. I'm, I'm really especially interested in how idealized images of the land shape our concept of the natural world. I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I'm, I've seen how tourist advertising, how um, even today filtered and cropped Instagram images don't always paint an accurate picture of what's happening to the environment. And so it's this idea of idealized imagery really forming how we think about nature and the environment. I'm gonna start by sharing some slides.
This is a series of log paintings that rest on the ground. And in this series, I was very interested in how taking an idealized image of nature and uh, basically painting it directly on the log slice. I really liked how there was this juxtaposition between an idealized image versus real wood, real bark, real cracks. Um, so this is log number seven in the series. These are a few more from that series. And in these, I took sections of a landscape and painted them directly on the log. And also when I paint these, um, it's almost as if I'm doing a tribute to the log. I, I work on the painting. I put a lot of time into the painting so it almost feels like it becomes a part of the log. These are large wall pieces that I've done. I call these composite landscapes. Uh, these, this one's about eight feet wide and four feet tall, and it's called Wilderness and consists of 194 oak, ash, and maple sections. It was inspired by Thomas Cole's Course of Empire. And, and in that series, he painted one landscape and depicted it as it, it, as it went from a pristine state to a civilized state and finally ending in destruction. So this were, for me was the first of three paintings that I did. And oops, I'm sorry. On this, you can see how I took one landscape and painted parts of it, fragmented it and painted on these different log slices. Um, and what happens is when you look at this painting, you're, you're, you're basically your brain fills in the space to create, to see a singular landscape. I showed this piece. This is um, from, this is a log I did when I was at an artist's residency at Jirasi in Woodside, California. And Unlike my other log paintings, this is one that I painted from direct observation. So the image on the log is the image that you would see if you were sitting in front of the log. It's basically a plain air painting with a log, a giant redwood log slice as a canvas. Um, in this painting also, I was interested in taking that, that landscape painting and letting nature dictate the dictate the the course of its how long it would last. You know, we're so used to seeing paintings in museums where they've been restored and preserved. And this time, I wanted to invert that, where I wanted to have the log itself dictate the life of the painting. These are walking sticks, and I show these because they give you an idea of some of the detail that I was interested in painting at the time. These are the very tops of the walking sticks. Um, the, the stick on the right is about the size of a dime and the one on the left is about the size of a nickel. Um, and these relate to the, the internment stone watercolors I was doing just in terms of the detail. And this is an image showing the installation view of the show up at Brattleboro. Um, there are 12 moon paintings that are 12 by 12 inches in size, and there are 12 internment stone watercolors, which are the paintings in the frames on the left. And unlike the log paintings using idealized imagery, these were different for me because they relied on careful observation, um, where I actually spent time really looking at the subject I was painting and then trying to depict it, sort of trying to capture as much as I could both realistically and in terms of uh, sort of the emotion and feel I was feeling at the time. I mean, the show, I realized there was a dialogue created between the moon paintings and the rock paintings. Um, in, in essence, I was, you know, there's, the moon was a big rock in the sky and then the watercolors were I was painting very tiny of stones that were sitting on my desk in the studio. These show, this shows the far wall with seven moon paintings. And so these moon paintings were based on notes I took at random times in my life when I would just happen to see the moon or um, on a night where the moon provided inspiration, comfort, or solace. I started taking notes in the 1990s and early 2000s. And I did a few of these moon paintings then, and I then didn't reach, did not return back to them until a couple years ago. And it was mainly because of the pandemic. I began to think about, especially during uncertain times, how one finds solace 
and what how one finds inspiration. And I also began to think about my grandfather, Yasuichi, who was incarcerated because of his Japanese ancestry during World War, World War II. And I started to think of the moon as something that connects us over generations and also connects us no matter where we are on earth. You know, I know he was looking at the same moon that his family in Hawaii was looking at, that same moon that I look at two generations later. This shows some of the sketches and you can see there's a paper towel. I just happen to have that in my purse. There's some pages torn out of a, a loose leaf um, pad. And then there's some more formalized sketches because I happened to be in my studio and I had my art supplies there. Uh, here's, here's a detail of some of my notes that I take. Um, and also remember this was a time pre smartphone, pre-digital cameras. So it was really hard to photograph the moon. And I found that it, it, was, it was more accurate and it, I got more information by taking notes, sort of similar to how the Hudson River School painters would go up into the Catskills, Adirondacks and Hudson River Valley, take notes during the summer, make sketches, and then return to their studios in New York City to complete the oil paintings that they did. So this is from New Year's Eve, 1998. And you can see uh, what I do is I take color notes. I almost envision myself in the studio and I think about what colors I would use to make the, to match the color I was seeing. For instance, this says cobalt, ultramarine, bluish, moon slightly lavender with gray with some purple clouds, no umber, more black, a little blue. And sometimes I'll write sort of how I feel at the moment. So on guess on New Year's Eve, I wrote very dark moment, overall darkness. So I, I guess I wasn't that happy that, that evening. And this shows, these slides show the finished moon paintings. This one is from Peterborough, New Hampshire, December 6, 1997 at 6.30 PM. And I was at the McDowell Artist Residency at the time. This moon is from Greenpoint, Brooklyn, May 17, 2000. This moon is from 1998 and I painted, this is the moon I saw on my brother's birthday. So it's called John's moon. Um, this moon was one that probably many, many people saw. It was the 2003 lunar eclipse. This is the moon I saw from Beacon, New York on November 8th at 8 p.m. And this moon is another moon that I'm sure many, many people saw. I don't know if the date August 14th, 15th, 2003 means anything to you, but it was the night of the blackout that affected the Northeast. And this is the moon I saw from Beacon, New York at 2.15 a.m. And lastly, this is the moon I saw when I was on Squirrel Island in Maine at 2 p.m. It was May 26, 1996. I'll move on to the internment stone watercolors. And they really are a story about my grandfather, Yasuichi Moritsugu, who arrived in Hawaii from Japan in 1907 at the age of 18. He headed a fishing village on the windward side of Oahu in a town called Heia. He married my grandmother and had eight children. Um, during World War II, he, even though he was lived, had lived in Hawaii for almost 40 years, he was incarcerated at the Santa Fe internment camp from 1943 until 1945. And um, he collected rocks while he was there. And these rocks were passed down to my, my father. And then when my father died in 2018, they were passed down to me. Um, when my grandfather returned back to Hawaii, he was a changed man and he died six years after he was incarcerated. So this shows the actual rocks on the top and then my watercolor painting below. And you know, I, I've tried to paint them about the same scale of the actual rocks. 
And I, I guess the whole point of me painting them, I, I felt like I wanted to spend time with these rocks and I really wanted to fully observe them. And by painting, painting allowed me to do that. I was hoping also to glean some information about my grandfather by painting these because he died 11 years before I, I was born and I, I never really, I never knew him. In fact, growing up, there was only one photo that my grandmother had of him. So he was sort of this mystery to me. These are the first six watercolor paintings. And these are the next six in the series. This shows the first watercolor painting in the series. This, this is number three in the series. And this is number six. And in his box of rocks, there were two teeth. So here's one of them. Thank you, Allison. Um, and I hope that if um, any of you haven't had a chance to see the show that you can come and see it before it closes on Sunday, February 12th. It's a really beautiful um, juxtaposition of those two bodies of work. I think, you know, they have a lot to say to one another. And I think we're about to get even deeper into uh, how those relationships work now that, that Aaron is here. So I'm going to hand it over back over to the two of you now and um, yeah, hope to learn a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks for the overview, Allison. Um, hi, everyone. I am here tonight in the capacity of Densho's community curator for the, the year, and that's an extension of Densho's Artist in Residency program. Um, I really have enjoyed this program because it acknowledges the role that art plays in helping us all um, remember and heal from um, the dark parts of our past. So I am going to get a little bit deeper with Allison and the first question I want to ask you is about um, terminology, Allison. So in the Japanese American community, we've been fighting for a long time for the proper usage of terminology that describes the incarceration experience and words like assembly center, evacuation, and the word internment have been used euphemistically by the US government to soften the experience. So I wondered if you could tell us why you chose to use the word internment in your title. Uh, that's a really good question. And I did spend time trying to figure out if I should title these watercolors inter internment stones or incarceration stones. It was, you know, uh, just because of that issue with so many words being used as euphemisms for sort of the actual more accurate word. Um, so the meaning of the word internment is the, deten the detention of sort of enemy aliens during times of war. So these were people that the United States considered threats during World War II. Um, this is a euphemism because two thirds of those in prison were actually American citizens, not aliens. Um, and so for my grandfather, he was not an American citizen because he had come from Japan. He, um, he, he lived in Hawaii for almost 40 years, but he wasn't considered a United States citizen. So in a way, internment is an accurate term for his imprisonment. And so I decided to just use that term. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I would like you to just give us further background on your grandfather, Moritsugu, um, and his history, especially as it relates to World War II, please. Well, um, I'm gonna go back sort of prior to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Um, the Japanese were 
moving across the Pacific, I think it was after the Battle of Midway that people in Hawaii were realized that they, there was a real threat. Um, so there was this buildup even prior to Pearl Harbor to sort of fortify the islands. Um, so my, in fact, my father worked as a carpenter's assistant in the summer before Pearl Harbor, helping um, as they were building Air Force hangar, um, you know, helping to build housing for military at the Kaneohe Naval Air Station, which was just not too far away from where he lived. And then on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1942, it was a Sunday. And my dad, I remember him telling me, you know, on Sundays, the military would do all this practicing. So he remembers all these planes flying towards Kaneohe Air Station on that day. And he thought, wow, they're really doing a big practice today. Um, and then he saw smoke coming from the hangars and he realized that it wasn't a practice, but it was actually an attack. And then shortly after Kaneohe Naval Air Station was bombed, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And then the next day, Hawaii was no longer under civilian rule. It was under military rule. So everything changed, you know, um, the money changed. Uh, the, my grandfather could no longer fish. That was how he made a living. So he ended up becoming a carpenter to help build machine gun nests. And my father helped made money stringing barbed wire along the beaches to, in case there was an invasion from Japanese. And then it was not until April, 1943, that military officials um, arrested my grandfather and took him home. And he, my dad said that he separated my grandmother from him. And they told, he told, they told my grandmother to pack a suitcase with some clothes and toiletries because they were going to take my grandfather away for a few days. And he had his young children, I think they were like age two, five and seven, they told them that they were taking my grandfather to a party. Um, what ended up happening, he was taken to Sand Island detention camp. He was there for three months. And then he was sent to Santa Fe internment camp, which was run by the Department of Justice. And he was there for almost three years. Um, and then my grandmother, because she had eight kids, had to figure out a way of supporting the family during this time. And I know especially for my grandfather. My father had said he was just really worried about how they were going to, you know, basically eat and live. Um, he was released in 1945, and he returned back to Hawaii with this box of rocks and a box of journals. Apparently, he spent most of his time in Santa Fe writing, and unfortunately, the journals have been lost. And so that's sort of the history I know about what happened to the family during World War II. Mm, thank you. It's, I think there's a lot of difficult parts of the story, but that family separation piece that happened at the very front of it is just, it's really chilling and rhymes a lot with things that are happening now. Um, and so I think your grandfather, Moritsugu, passed away several years before you were born, right? Yeah, it was 11 years before I was born. Okay. So I wonder how you learned these things about him and the war years. <laughs> well, I think I sort of laugh because it's a common story with a lot of Japanese American families that this really wasn't talked about much. Like, I just never knew there was anything like these incarceration camps growing up. You know, my family on my mom's side would talk about, um, you know, they remember having to build, uh, dig air shelters. And my mom used to say, we had to carry around these big gas masks when we were little kids. Um, and then she would tell me about my, her uncle Jerry, who joined the army and fought in the 100th Infantry Battalion which the, it was a group, battalion from Hawaii that fought in Europe. And he fought in Italy at the Battle of Monte Cassino. So I sort of knew all those stories, but I really didn't know that there was, you know, Japanese and Japanese Americans were put, being put into these camps. Um, in the, I think, when was it? I was a teenager and that movie, Farewell to Manzanar came out. I think it was like 1976. And we watched it as a family. And I remember sort of, 
I remember thinking, what? <laughs> like, I can't believe that happened, you know? Sort of the first time I saw Asian, all these Asian actors in a movie, because you didn't really see that at the time. And then I remember thinking, wow, there's this movie full of Asian actors, and it's a story about how they were all in prison during World War II. And so it was really unsettling for me. Um, so, you know, I sort of found out that on my mom's side of the family, she had a cousin, that family lost their house and their, um, their livelihood in California. Um, but at no point did we have a family discussion and at no point did my father say, oh, that happened to your grandfather. You know, like it was sort of, okay, that happened, push it aside. Um, and then when my, my father retired, he wrote his autobiography and it ended up being 140 pages and it went into detail, whatever detail he could remember, very factual about his life. And there was a section about World War II and what happened to the family. So that's when I got more information about the incarceration. And then in 2011, when my dad was 86 years old, Densho, that's how I found out about Densho, um, interviewed him to get his oral history. And so after watching those interviews, I learned even more. You know, it, it was really interesting because Densho sort of knew the right questions to ask. They sort of had that historical background of what happened so they could sort of ask certain questions and put it into a timeline. That was really great. And those interviews are really invaluable to me. Mm, yeah, so lucky. Yeah, and I, I always think about, you know, how this, the Nisei, the second generation, the American born generation, they were supposed to be the ones who, you know, had this great flourishing of self, but it was suppressed by this incarceration experience. And so now us, Sansei and Yonsei are, um, you know, asking questions and really trying to understand what it means for this history to be seen, what it means for us and what it means for um, our ancestors too. Um, I just wanted to share that I also have been so grateful for the trove of information, photographs and interviews and documents and, and then um, presentations like this that Densho has made possible. Um, <clears throat> I was just going to show the audience a couple of images of my work that I have done for Densho. Oops, let's get the screen up there. Um, including these large wheat paste murals using photographs from the collection. And um, I think they've had quite a bit of impact. I include interpretive text um, with all of my work. And, and now some smaller pieces that are um, in museums. And this one is about Japanese American and black reparations. Um, so tell us a little bit more about how you've used the Densho archive, Allison. Well, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that when I make artwork, I don't actually start with the knowledge of what the artwork is about. You know, with the log paint, I kind of have an inkling of something I want to make and something I want to maybe paint. Um, and then as I'm creating it, I make more connections. And sometimes it's after the piece is done that I'm able to sort of understand more what I made <laughs> and what it might mean and more delve into more history about it. So with the rock watercolors, you know, my goal was I, I, I got this box of rocks and I thought I really wanna paint rocks because I'm a landscape painter, you know, sort of this exercise in observation. So that's how the project started. And then I also, had this connection, you know, I felt like I could somehow maybe connect with my grandfather. The rock sort of served as a touchstone to who he is. Um, and then I finished them. I put the work up in Brattleboro. <clears throat> I installed the pieces. And then I started to really do a lot more research using the Densho archive and to sort of, you know, my, my 
main question was, what was it like at the Santa Fe internment camp? You know, what, what was the environment like? What was the landscape like? And so I, you know, there's very, very little information about this, but I found that the Dencho archive was really great. Um, they have a Dencho encyclopedia. So you could put in, you know, the name of a camp or you could put in the name of an event and it works just like an encyclopedia, that information comes out. So using, using the Dencho archive, let me show, share my slides here. All right, I found out, the first thing I found out, you know, I, after seeing that movie that I remember way back when I was a teenager, Farewell to Manzo, Manzo and I just assumed that the camp was families, that they, it was a camp full of Japanese and Japanese American families. But I found out that this was a camp of all men. Um, and these images are from the Den Show, Henrietta Schoen collection, she was a nurse in the infirmary and she took some snapshots. I mean, they're mainly photos of the medical staff in front of buildings. But these two I thought were really interesting because they show the men arriving by train at the Lamy station, which was about 16 miles away from the camp. And then from there, they traveled by truck the rest of the way. Um, and you can see in the photo on the right that the men have one, one suitcase and a heavy coat um, the, the barracks, the buildings at the camp were basically wood frames with tar paper and the weather would get down below zero in the winter. And speaking of cold weather, you know, we're kind of expecting that kind of weather tonight here in the Northeast and it would go above 90, degree, 90 degrees in the summer. So, you know, just the idea that you have your coat in your suitcase and then you'll be housed in, in buildings with tar paper siding um, this kind of gave me an idea of the conditions that they were living in. I also found out that there were three waves of men that arrived. There were actually five, but the three main waves were, the first group was right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. These were the middle-aged and older Issei from California, and they were usually the community leaders, and they spoke Japanese. And the second wave of men that arrived um, was about March 1943. And again, these were older community leaders, but they also included those from Hawaii, Alaska, and Latin America, including their men, you know, Peru especially. And so this was the second wave was the wave that my grandfather was in. And then I found out towards the end of 1944, a third wave of men arrived. And these were 800 young Nisei or second generation men. And they had caused disturbances at other camps like Tule Lake in California, and they were labeled troublemakers. Um, and they clashed with the prison guards as well as some of the older population. This is an image from the New Mexico History Museum archives. And I thought this was really interesting, especially as a landscape painter. I, I, you know, from this image, I got a real sense of what the landscape was like and sort of how vast it was how dry and how arid and, and in the terrain. And I, you can even see, oh, I, I remember thinking, oh, this, no wonder my grandfather collected all those rocks because just look at all of those rocks in the landscape. Um, a detail of that is here. And I, have, I also found out sort of a few historical events that happened during the time when my grandfather was there. So. Shortly before he arrived in 1943, the mess hall burned down. So the food apparently was really terrible until the mess hall was rebuilt. And then in 1945, there was, it was very overcrowded as more men arrived. Um, apparently there were over 2000 men housed in these buildings here. And I also read that some of them built foxholes under their beds to just get some privacy. And then finally, in March 1945, there was a clash between about 250 of the younger men who had arrived from Tule Lake and the prison guards. Uh, I guess tear gas and batons were used, and four of them ended up hospitalized with injuries. So there was, there, it, there was a lot of tension at the camp during this time. Um, six months later, after this clash, my grandfather returned back to Hawaii. 
And then six months later after that, in 1946, the camp was finally closed. So that's what I found out. Like it was you know, going from no information about the camp to all that kind of gave me a sense, uh, more of an understanding of the conditions he had to had to live through. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fortunate that you were able to piece some of this together, and I think that probably leads into my next question is, uh, which is the rocks. Yeah. Why, why the rocks, Allison? Why? <laughs> Tell us more about why you decided to paint these rocks. Okay, the rocks. Okay. Um, I I knew about these rocks. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little bit about these rocks. I knew about these rocks. I mean, I knew that they existed because my dad had once showed me. He pulled down this box from the garage, and it was, you know, these rocks wrapped in newspaper put in a plastic bag, tied with some string, put in another plastic bag, put in a box and kept on the third shelf of the garage. <laughs> and so uh, I knew they existed. And I remember thinking, oh, um, it would be great if someday I could paint them, you know, because I thought, oh, that would be really cool to paint them because they used, my grandfather used to own them. And uh and I spoke to my aunt a couple months ago and she said, oh, she remembers the rocks. So I guess she remember, I guess when my grandparents were moving out of my uncle's house, she said, I remember them. I have this vision of them in the, the trunk of a car. And I remember talking to your uncle and I said, we were saying, who's going to want a box of rocks? There's nothing special about these rocks. And they said, oh, Toshio, my father, he'd want them. So they gave them to my father, who then stored them in the garage for all those years. Um, so when they arrive, let me share a screen here. So they arrived in a plastic bag and they were all dusty and they were, you know, mixed in with some dirt and they really looked like a bag of just brown and red gravel, so to speak. And so this is a picture of them after I washed and cleaned them. Um, they're not in the same box they arrived in. This is just a box I have in my studio. And I, I started to think about the rocks and the natural environment they came from. And so about the landscape that they came from. And then I started to think about my grandfather. And, and, and I was wondering what qualities of these rocks caught his interest. You know, some are really obvious, like some are just really beautiful and crystalline, but some are really simple and kind of boring and unassuming. So I was also thinking about, I don't know, um, going for a walk on the beach. And you know how you walk on the beach and you pick up a pebble or a shell out of all the millions of pebbles on that beach? You know, what is it about that one one stone that calls out to you. And so I sort of was thinking about what, why did he pick these stones and not other stones? And I sort of felt by studying them and being with them, I might be able to get some understanding of who he was. And I'd like to read the last paragraph of my artist statement for the show, because I kind of think this sums up best this idea of why I painted the rocks. As painters, we know the importance of the sensory and visual world. Each subject we choose to paint, each color and material we select to work with, each vis visual decision we make gives insight into who we are. In a similar way, each stone my grandfather selected and then carefully packed and carried back home to Hawaii is a reflection of who he was. So that's that's sort of the story of the rocks. Thank you. I just think it's really wonderful that you were able to fuse yourself with some of the spirit of, of your grandfather. And I really appreciate your work. Um, I hope there's some questions in the chat, but I will go ahead and um, maybe ask the first one just to get things going before Sarah takes over. Um, if it's not too personal a question, Allison, I just wondered what kind of things you thought about when you're in that process of painting the rocks. 
Oh, that's a really good, tough question. <laughs> um, when I first started painting the rocks, I really, I, for the first couple months, I actually painted in silence. Like I didn't have any music on. It was first mainly because it was the first time I was painting rocks. I was using watercolor where I normally paint in oil. So it was sort of this, I was trying to concentrate and trying to really focus on what I was painting. And I think also the, um, the fact I was observing, seeing, and then painting what I saw required a different, you know, a real focused uh, concentration. But I did, as I was painting these rocks, I did think about my grandfather and I did think about, oh, you know, he held this rock in his hand. You know, there's sort of this weird connection I was having with them. Um, just as anyone might have, if you inherit some, inherit a personal belonging from someone you love, you know, you, there's sort of this funny connection. It's an object, but it's imbued with much more than that. So um, I was thinking about that when I was painting. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, also, you know, we have these traditions in our, you know, cultural backgrounds, such as Shinto, where there's spirit and all of these things. So makes a lot of sense to me. Um, thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Sarah now for other questions. Thank you both. We actually have a, a great question that's very related from um, Jackie Skruzinski, who asks, uh, like the moon, you and your grandfather share the texture and touch of the rocks. Do they feel like an intermediary? They did. Um, and, you know, again, I as I said earlier, I didn't really know the full history mm. because I hadn't done the research on the dental, you know, using the dental archive and the databases um, and speaking to my aunts. I just knew of them as objects and the, and I was seeing them, I was seeing them as a painter would see them, you know, and so, but I did, I did start to look at things like, oh, this rock is really interesting. Like, oh, I probably would have selected this if I mm. saw it out of a lot of rocks. You know, I was starting to do things like that. Um, mm. And, you know, I had done a piece a number of years back where I did this installation where I tied these knots on this net and it was installed outside for a while. But I did it because my grandfather's fisherman and he was constantly repairing and fixing nets. And I remember tying basically two miles of cordage into these patterns, I remember the physical act of tying the knots, knots somehow weirdly connected me mm -hmm. to him, even though I never knew him. It was almost the physical act of actually making something in a mm -hmm. similar way that he might have made something. I just felt a connection through that. So it, the rocks were similar where mm -hmm. um, I can't even, I almost can't describe it, but they were kind of like a touchstone to him. Yeah, we've got some, a lot of questions coming in fast and furious here. Um, Kathy Masaoka asks, oh, sorry. Um, how did your father, aunts and uncles describe your grandfather? You talked about the fact that your grandfather came back from Santa Fe, a changed man. Did you ever figure out what that, that change was? I, I did ask, um, in fact, I asked my aunt, just a couple months ago when I spoke to her. Um, in my dad's autobiography, he says, and in the Densho interview he did, he said, my grandfather, I mean, he was, you know, sort of headed a fishing community. So he was this very strong, energetic man. And apparently my dad said he was never sick a day in his life. He was that kind of man. Um, and so he went to the camp and we, when he came back, sort of the way, way people, my relatives have described him as he was very quiet and he was almost subdued and he he lost his energy. And then after, you know, shortly after his health started declining. Um, and I think, you know, maybe, I mean, I don't really know. Maybe he was ashamed that he was incarcerated. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it took a mental toll on him. I don't really know, but he was, he was different. You know, he went from a vibrant, person to one who is not. Yeah. And Masaru asks uh, if your father heard stories from your grandfather about his life during uh, internment in Santa Fe. No, nothing. There is nothing. Um, my father was 
I think he was 18 at the time. Um, he was the oldest of the eight kids. And they, I don't think he knew anything about it. I mean, I think he would have written it in his autobiography. Yeah. Um, but it was, I think, to the Issei generation, my grandparents were trying to protect all their kids. Like, they did not want them to know the experience mm -hmm. or what was really happening. You know, they were trying to protect them sort of from what was going on. So I think that's what happens with the Nisei second generation. You know, not they're sort of, they only know so much because they were only told so much because they were being protective, protected. And, you know, nobody, they didn't want, my grandparents didn't want my, my father's and his, my aunts and uncles to worry. Yeah. And um, another question is, was your, if your grandmother was confined separately at, at another site or if she was? No, it was just my grandfather. So my grandmother, um, was not taken away, but she then had to support eight children, right? And my grandfather used to be the breadwinner. And now somehow she had to yeah. make a living. Yeah. And we've got, um, I, I mean, there's so many questions and they're good ones. This one is from Marilyn Fever, who writes, I was seven years old in 1941 and living in Waikea Uka, Hawaii, the mountainside of Hilo, all during my education in Hawaii, in Hawaii and Oahu, I did not know that any Issei or Nisei living in Hawaii were sent to concentration camps on the mainland. In 2014, I found out while visiting the Volcano National Park that a speaker spoke about the camps on Oahu. Is your father's autobiography published? And if so, what was it called and what was his name? So it sounds like he would have had some, some fans, some readers of his. Well, my father's name was Toshio Moritsugu and his autobiography is not published. He worked mm -hmm. really hard on it, um, but he gave it just, it was mainly for, for the immediate family. Mm -hmm. um, but it's true, like we did not, there was no lesson in school where we studied, you know, the incarceration of Japanese and Japanese American. And, and uh, you know, there were about 2000 people from Hawaii who were imprisoned. And, you know, that's not known much, but there is, I don't know if it's open to the public yet, um, but Honu'uli Uli, you know, my grandfather was held at Sand Island camp, um, I think internment camp or detention center. And there was another one in the middle of the island of Oahu called Honolulu, Uli, which is now a national site that you can visit. I don't know if it's open right now to the public or not, but it will, it should be soon. And um, we have someone else who says, I had an art teacher at Stevenson named Moritsugu. That's back my in the mom. 80s. There you go. And, <laughs> my the, oh my God. <laughs> and this person, Kara K says, in case I need to leave before you can answer, she was a great inspiration to me and I treasured my classes with her. Oh, I have to tell her. So, <laughs> wow. Yes. My mom was a public school art teacher at Stevenson Intermediate. So I will let her know. That's wonderful. Um, and we have a, a question from Diana Cole that I've been kind of wondering myself, which of your paintings, well, which of your paintings are created in oil and which ones in watercolor and why do you choose one medium over the other? So all the paintings on the log slices are oil and just the internment stone um, are, those are watercolor. And that's a really good question. I think for, for the log paintings, you know, it's, there's the tradition of doing oil paintings on oil panels. Mm -hmm. So it sort of made sense to do oil paintings on these log slices. And then for the internment stones, I, part of it was because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to use a different medium and mm -hmm. watercolor is more immediate. Um, it still took me a long time to do each of those paintings. Uh, but it, I think I wanted something almost, I was painting them on white paper and I almost wanted something that was going to honor that white paper. Um, so yeah. watercolor seemed to make a lot of sense. Hmm. And um, we have another Stevenson Intermediate uh, School person here. So <laughs> that's 
fantastic. That's wonderful. And um, we have another question asking, out of all the rocks that were in that box, why did you select those specific rocks? And, um, and how did you decide how to arrange them? It, I, it's something just thought popped in my head. So my grandfather selected these rocks from the landscape. And then I then selected the rocks that he selected, right? Anyway, um, ah, hmm. it's a, the answer is that it was just a gut feeling, you know, I had these, you saw the box of rocks and I would just pick out a handful of rocks that I thought might go well together and I would arrange them. And it was, a lot of it was just very instinctual. I didn't want to overthink hmm. it. You know, sometimes I would, I would make a grouping of seven rocks that was very um, random looking. And sometimes I created something more formal, like with the four rocks. So I, I really wouldn't spend more than 20 minutes selecting mm -hmm. the rocks and arranging them. I just wanted it to be very direct and um, very gut from my gut, just as you would select rocks from a seashore. Mm. And um, somebody else wants to know around how many rocks there are, and if you did any work trying to identify the, the different types <laughs> of rocks. There are, oh, I, I actually didn't sit down and count them. Um, I don't know, maybe about, maybe a little over a hundred, you know, so I'm trying to guess jelly beans in a, a jar, but I, maybe a little over a hundred. And in terms of finding out what type of rocks they are. I think that's going to be my next deep dive. You know, I'm going to try and see if I can find a geologist that knows Southwestern um, mineralogy. Uh, but I also, I, sometimes I kind of wanted to go into painting these with not knowing about their um, mm -hmm. the geology or not identifying them. Because I sometimes when you know too much about your subject, it, it sort of gives each rock a different value. So mm -hmm. you know, my grandfather was from Hawaii, where there are, you know, Hawaii was formed by volcanoes, the, you know, so there's like, uh, uh, pahoi, hoi, lava flows. So that's, that's the mm. minerals there. And he was plunked down in the Southwest with a completely different geology. So I, I, I almost didn't want to know too much about the specifics of the rocks. I kind of mm. wanted to make my decisions based on visual, um, you know, based on, as an artist would on the visual. Yeah, I'm wondering um, also kind of how, when you're working on something that requires close observation, how that changes your relationship to the, if that's something that, you know, like kind of how has your relationship to this collection changed and what are you now, you know, b besides perhaps identifying the different rocks, what are you going to, to do with the collection? How does it, you know, does it feel different to you in any way? Well, I do have to say the rocks I painted, I know really well. Yeah. Like I know, I, you know, I kind of know, okay, you know, where the crack is and what, what happens during the day when the light, the sun moves across the sky and how one, one surface picks up you know, in the morning, it's going to be yellower. And then by the afternoon, when there's more blue in the sky, that yellow is going to become more of a gray. You know, I sort of, I know the rocks that way. And those are the rocks I painted. So the rocks I haven't painted, I, I almost feel like I don't know them yet. Um, mm. um, in terms of what I'm going to do with the rocks, I, I just, I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, we have a, another question here from Sarah Linda, who asks if at some point the landscape quality of the rocks veer into that of still life for you. Um, and if you can comment on that relationship, the relationship between the landscape and, and I guess the objects themselves and the potential emotional content. Um, okay, I'm, I don't know if I can answer this uh, exactly. Um, You know, I am a landscape painter, so these rocks, and I did mention part of why I started to paint them was sort of an exercise in learning how to paint rocks, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so yes, I, I do think of them, I think of them as part, you know, part of me thinks of them as part of a landscape. You know, so the mm -hmm. reds, I kind of envision what kind of hills might exist in the area. Um, so in terms of the rocks being having landscape qualities, I guess, 
I, that's why I had that real interest in trying to find an image of what the camp looked like. You know, it's almost like I want to be able to place that object into a real landscape. So there's sort of that going on. And what was the second part of the question? Oh, I just the the kind of emotional connection between the the possibility of imagining yourself or imagining your grandfather in that landscape and his connection and your connection with those rocks, those actual. Um, I, I did. I, I I did actually try and envision him in that landscape. Mm. You know, I did try to envision him picking up the rocks or maybe trading those rocks with other people who had collected rocks there. Um, and then I think too, um, I did think about the moon at the same time. I did envision him picking up rocks, and I did envision yeah. him looking at the moon you know so those are that was kind of this this image i had in my mind um as i was working on this show maybe he never looked at the moon i don't know but that's what i was thinking yeah of course um and that that also relates to this other question from sarah linda she says i'm struck by how you were able to connect across space time and dimension to your grandfather through the tangible and intangible did you come to look at the moon as another rock by having closely observed those touchstones thereby making the connection to the moon you and he shared that much more tangible i did i actually did do that um in a funny way, when I was painting the moons, which are in oil, you know, I was trying to depict some of the craters. And in, when, in doing that, I do remember thinking, oh, you know, I'm basically painting a big rock in the sky, right? It's right. sort of, you know, the way the light hits it and the way um, the craters, the texture of the moon, and I would think about the texture of the rock. So there was a real back and forth between the two. Mm, yeah. And I guess, you know, w some of the conversations that we had when we were first talking about this show was, were, you know, about the, the connection with, with nature and not getting as, you know, as specific about the, um, the connection across time and dimensions, which I think is really interesting. But I'm, I'm wondering if how this kind of fits into your the broader scope of your work as as a landscape painter and if this is something that you think kind of is part of a continuum or if you think it's something that's kind of taking you in a, a different or new direction well i do feel like it's part of the work i do because it is based on the landscape um i also when i do my work i really it's just me but i i really want to create something that is beautiful that really sort of honors nature and landscape and so this the rocks and the moon i think fall into that mm. um, i i did want to do something different than more paintings on logs so yeah. i feel like the watercolors especially um are kind of a new direction you know it, it's uh they're more immediate yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think um, any of you out there who are oil painters and use a lot of glazes, it's this mm -hmm. process where you paint and you have to let it dry and then you come back to it. And it, it, it's, it takes a lot of time um, with the watercolor. You know, the fact that watercolors can dry so quickly, it, things sort of moved along very mm -hmm. quickly in, in, in relation to oil paintings for me. Um, and I really did enjoy that. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens when I go back to doing some of these landscapes, especially the foreground where there's always a lot of rocks. Like I'm interested in seeing how what I've yeah. learned from painting the watercolors is going to yeah. might affect, you know, some of the landscape paintings that I do. Yeah, oh, that's interesting to imagine. Are you going to go back to painting in oil? Yeah, I will. I will. But it's nice <laughs> have, it's also nice yeah. to have some other series body of work to work on at the same time. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Um, so those for now, it seems like those are all the questions that we have. We do have a comment here from Masaru just letting us know that a number of other resources are available 
telling about the Santa Fe internment camp and its prisoners. One project was done by the New Mexico JACL, Confinement in Land of Enchantment, Japanese Americans in New Mexico during uh, World War II. Santa Fe and three other prison sites in New Mexico are covered. And Densho has a copy of a publication and other write-ups. So it sounds like um, for those of you who are interested in pursuing and, and delving deeper that Densho, the Densho website will be a really wonderful resource. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank Densho and thank you to Aaron and to Natasha Densho for all of all of your help and all of your work putting this together. It was really fantastic having that, you know, this whole other layer to the to the work. And thank you to Allison for having the idea for to to put this together. It was really fantastic. Well, I want to thank you, Sarah, for for letting me show work. Um, <laughs> That was different than my log paintings. I really appreciate that. You know, it gave me the opportunity to do that. And Aaron, it was great meeting you and working with you. It's, it was really, it was wonderful. And Natasha, who's not in any of the screens here, thank you too for your support. Yeah, but, um, and thank you. And thank you for joining us from another time, time zone, Aaron. That's very nice of you. And um, thank you to Phoebe who put this all together on the, the back end. And um, it also is worth saying that this, for you know anybody who had to bow out early or anything, this is going to be available on the BMAC website in a couple of days. And I'll make sure that Aaron, you and Natasha have access to it so you can share it and Allison, you can share it as well. But thank you so much for being here this evening. And again, February 12th is the last day, Sunday, February 12th is the last day of this exhibit. And um, so please, I hope everyone can come and come and see it because it's a truly a beautiful, beautiful show. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, and, everyone. Yeah. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>